capturing images to reveal a way of life, to read the community in the traces of their monuments and in the memories of people who knew them, searching to create and recreate the past, and in so doing to predict the future in the images of the present. During the 500 years of their existence in Turkey, the Sephardim built upon their Judeo-Spanish heritage, the language, customs, mannerisms of the host country, first as subjects of the Ottoman Empire, then as citizens of modern Turkey. How did they achieve this? Part of the answer to this complex question lies in the traces of the past. On some of our trips to explore and discover the Jewish past in Turkey, which goes back to biblical times, we were accompanied by our then five-year-old daughter, Han. We wanted her to learn about the two cultural traditions that she shared with her parents, one an American Jew, the other a Muslim Turk. We stopped at the ancient city of Sardis near Izmir. It had been the capital of the Lydian Empire in third century AD when under Roman rule, a monumental synagogue served the needs of the community. Among the excavated remains were workshops belonging to Jewish merchants. The structure had originally been built as a Roman tribunal. Its size and formal layout revealed a large and well-to-do community. There were fine examples of mosaic designs adorning the floor and the walls. In the words of the noted Islamic scholar Bernard Lewis, the Jews were complementary to the Turks and not in competition with them. One, the Jews functioned in economic pursuits which lay outside the domain of the Turkish elites. Two, from the Turkish point of view, the Jews not being Christian, had the advantage of not being suspect of treasonable sympathies with the major enemy of the Ottomans, which of course meant European Christendom. The Jews came on ships from Spain and later Portugal across the Mediterranean in the 15th century. We were to visit over 35 places where they had lived in Turkey or were still living. Most of the 22,000 Jews live in Istanbul. About 2,000 live in Izmir, a city on the Aegean. Izmir had a Jewish population as early as the second century, but the community was not formally organized until the influx of Sephardim from elsewhere in the Ottoman Empire in the 17th century. Avner and Yildiz Cikurel, a retired couple living in Izmir, had invited us to their home for a Sabbath evening, which began with the lighting of their oil candles, the tradition that marks the beginning of Sabbath at sunset every Friday evening. Normally, lighting the candles is a woman's task, but Mr. Chikorel liked to help his wife with everything. Nel ser Shabbat Kodesh. Shabbat alegre, Shabbat shalom, haberes buenos, alegres que recibamos amén. In the course of our travels, when we drove into a small town, we stopped near the center and asked an older man if he knew where the old Jewish quarter was. 
Along Harresokat, meaning street of the synagogues in the Juderia, are several synagogues. They are like precious gems, recalling the golden era of Izmir Jewry in the 17th and early 18th centuries, when the city became an important center of Mediterranean commerce and the Jewish community included eminent rabbis, renowned physicians, wealthy merchants, and Talmudic learning and Hebrew literature flourished. The Shalom Synagogue is looked after by Nesim Escapa, who on a weekly basis opens it for the few elderly men who still pray there. Nesim told Lawrence that the synagogue was also known as the Aydan Synagogue because many of the men who used to frequent it were from that town. Nevertheless, its real name was the Shalom Synagogue. Most of Izmir's Jews emigrated to Israel after 1948. The few that remain try to preserve their Jewish traditions, but their diminishing numbers does not allow for the maintenance of these synagogues on a continuing basis. The false messiah, Sabbatai Svi, was born in Izmir in 1626. The noted scholar of Jewish mysticism, Gershom Sholem, calls the Sabbatai movement the most important messianic movement in Judaism since the destruction of the Second Temple. In the mid-17th century, Sabbatai Svi was the center of unprecedented religious turmoil for Jews all over the world. Alternating between the ascetic piety and transgressions of the law, Sabbatai was eventually excommunicated by the rabbis of Izmir and of every other city he visited, but his disciples increased. Samuel Cohen of Izmir pointed out an old building near the Agora, which was reputedly Svi's house of birth. Mashiach y cada uno estará reposado debajo de su higuera y de su parra y de su viña. Y en este terrado, terrado llaman en español, arriba, recogía a los talmidim suyos que tenía y les daba lición y les inculcaba y eh, hacía su, su misión de Mashiach, de Salvador. Era el evo de Rabascapa y después él empezó a profetizar y a ver cosas Svi's house, presently used as a shoe factory, a traditional Jewish trade. The rabbis were greatly shaken by his messianic claims, but could not stop him from forming a passionate group of followers. Finally, the rabbis threatened to excommunicate him and appealed to the Sultan to order Svi to stop his fanatic teachings. He was taken to Edirne to have an audience with the royal council. The outcome was Sabatai's decision to convert to Islam. There's a legend that the Sultan asked Svi to submit to a test to prove he was the Messiah, that his archers would shoot him full of arrows. If no blood appeared, the Sultan would accept Svi's claim of being the Messiah. If, on the other hand, Svi didn't wish to take this test, he had to convert to Islam. The pragmatic Svi chose Islam, as did many of his followers. The converts practiced both Islamic and Jewish rituals. The descendants of Sabbatai's followers who are outwardly Muslim are known as Dönme, meaning convert, and have a special area in a cemetery in Istanbul at Üsküdar, which is named after a nearby brook called the Stream of Nightingales. According to a biblical reference, the Messiah will come when the nightingales sing.
At Çorlu, a small town west of Istanbul in Thrace, we found a synagogue that had been converted into a mosque. Sometime in the 1960s, their community gave the synagogue over to the Office of Islamic Pious Trust with the request that it be continued to be used as a house of prayer. Thus, it became a neighborhood mosque known as the Havra Jami, or Synagogue Mosque. After the services, Aisha talked to the men gathered in the courtyard. The conversation was about the favorable nature of the relationship between the Jews and their Turkish neighbors. The men remembered that during Passover holidays, Jews would bake unleavened bread and bring it to their Turkish neighbors. Lawrence and Han visited Chorlu's Jewish cemetery. With no one to look after it, it had deteriorated considerably. Why had the Jews left Chorlu and the other small towns? Driving west from Chorlu, we came to Edirne, situated on the Bulgarian and Greek borders, formerly the Roman city Adrianople, where about 25 Jews still live. There we met Dr. Yasef Bayar, who was able to explain to us why the Jewish communities of Thrace had disappeared over the course of the past 90 years. Biz, the only country that really opened their arms was Turkey to us, no one else, so we are very grateful. We did our military service here, my father, my sons, everyone. But this doesn't mean that we, were, we didn't have hardships in Turkey either. Dr. Bayar went on to explain that in the past 80 years, wars, riots, and revolutions created instability in Thrace, and that Jews had already begun to move away from Thrace since the beginning of the century. Added to everything else was a capital asset tax, Varlık Vergisi, levied disproportionately against Turkey's non-Muslim minorities in the early 1940s. In 1948, many left for Israel, including Dr. Bayar, who later returned. Atatürk statue looms over Edirne's urban landscape, making a symbolic transition from Ottoman to Republican times. Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, the first president and founder of modern Turkey, acknowledged the Jewish peoples in Turkey as the most faithful of all minority groups. Dr. Bayar showed us an old book containing pictures of medical professors Professor with whom he studied Orovich. at Istanbul University. Professor Braun. Professor Oberndorfer. Professor Hirsch. Professor Schwartz. Efendim profesör bu bu da çok meşhurdur bu Akil Muhtar. Türk. Evet Türk ama çok meşhur. From Edirne we headed south to the Aegean region arriving in Bergama the site of ancient Pergamon. On an earlier trip we had met Bulisa and her husband Karaolan the last Jewish family of Bergama. Bulisa gave the sad news of her husband's death. Her sons had taken over the business. She felt comfortable being here, even as a single person. Neighbors were close and kind, she said. Here was their home and the business of her late husband. Everyone recognized her and respected her. Bergama's only remaining synagogue was now used as a granary. 
In its upper story windows, pigeons and doves nestled, waiting for opportunities to swoop down and pick on the grains that had fallen on the marble floor. Its main reading desk, Teva, as it is called by the Sephardim, had the shape of an ark, suggesting the boats that had brought the Spanish Jews to the Ottoman lands. almost like a son to her. Uh, he's, of course, a Turkish uh, boy. But what he's saying is that we were so close as neighbors to one another. My father used to go to their house, and he used to open the uh, the closets and things in search of almond paste because she always made the m most wonderful, tasteful almond paste in the city. And uh, they were known to be the very, very uh, honest uh, tradespeople in the town. We always respected this uh, community here. Now that the last one is still living with us, we would like to keep her as kindly and as nicely as possible. Our travels across the country brought to light some Jewish monuments intact and many others in poor repair. We delved into the peaks and valleys of the distant past. <laughs> Bulisa of Bergama, the legacy of Maurice Shinasi, preserved in his 60-year-old hospital in Manisa, and many, many more. But the oral history is provided by the living Jews and the Turks, who had shared lives in the same towns, confirmed the relatively harmonious Jewish-Turkish coexistence of the past 500 years.